Okay. <clears throat> the following interview was conducted with James B. Dwork and Chancellor of Purdue North Central and Professor of Management for, at Purdue University for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, uh, June 16, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History librarian. Good morning, Professor Dwork, and thank you. Well, good morning, Catherine. It's and, nice to be uh, here. Thank you. And um, tell us a little about where you were born and your parents in early years. Um, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the Jewish hospital. My dad was a physician in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was a eye, ear, nose, and throat doctor. My mom and dad both went to the University of Cincinnati. So I grew up my whole life uh, on the Ohio River, used to hot weather. And I went to the University of Cincinnati for my undergraduate degree. I, I always thought I might become a doctor because my dad was a doctor. So I took some courses in pre-med, but then I really liked uh, my courses that I had in uh, labor economics, and so I became a labor economist. And so I, I finished my undergrad degree at the University of Cincinnati, and I stayed and took a one-year master's degree in industrial relations at the University of Cincinnati. And then I uh, went to the University of Minnesota for my PhD. Okay. I have two brothers, a, uh, two younger brothers, and uh, my one brother's a uh, doctor out in Portland, Oregon, and the other one <clears throat> lives in Florida, we were just talking about. He, he works for a company from Louisville called Louisville Bedding. Good. Let's talk. Let's back up just a little bit. Tell about uh, a little bit about high school. What uh, any organization? It was grade school. A little bit about that too. Um, <clears throat> I went to Pleasant Ridge School, and uh, I used to walk to school. And one of the things I remember is uh, when I'd walk home. It was probably a mile to walk to school. And when, when I'd walk home, my dog Peppy was there to meet me. You know, it was always kind of fun to see my dog. Um, my grandmother. All my grandparents migrated from Russia. And so um, my grandmother was the first uh, builder in uh, Cincinnati. So I could take you to Cincinnati and show you apartments that she had built. And so we lived in a house that, that, uh, where she was a contractor back uh, when I was a kid. Uh, then I went to a, a, a college prep high school called uh, Walnut Hills High School, where my mom had graduated uh, before me, which I would think was kind of special. And all the brothers went to Walnut Hills High School. Um, like I said, college prep, we took all kinds of courses, getting ready. everybody I think 99% of the people um, went to college. I was athletic in high school. Um, I, um, while I didn't play uh, in on high school team, I did a little bit, maybe like uh, some junior varsity. I, I played a lot uh, at the local Jewish community center, and I was pretty good in baseball and pretty good in, in uh, basketball. I actually played on a team um, when I was a senior in high school that won a tournament called the uh, National Jewish Welfare Board, and we got to go to Brazil, and we played in the Pan American Maccabee Games, and so I got a gold medal for, for, sure. for that. So I, I was a pretty good athlete, and uh, I was, uh, uh, I wasn't too involved in school in terms of uh, I was in a fraternity in high school, and I would say that I was uh, more interested in other things than studies. But I was always a good student. It, was, sure. it came to me pretty naturally, and uh, I was good in math, and I was good. I was almost good in every subject. Uh, the subjects I didn't like too much were the ones that I thought. Uh, you know, I would have liked like chemistry because uh, I thought I was probably going to be a, a doctor like my dad. Yeah. See, back in high school, we didn't have very much in the way of counseling in terms of what do you want to be or things like that. And they never did kind of tests that could help you out. So sure. I really had to learn that on my own. And like I said, when I started at the University of Cincinnati, I was pre-med. And the first I had to take some distribution requirements. And the first course I really liked in college was when I took uh, uh, Introduction to Economics. And my professor, by the name of Al Berry, uh, he actually thought I was such a good student. He he hired me to be a teaching assistant for him in the big lecture course. So I would do the Fridays, and also he hired me to work for him for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Cincinnati. And so uh, the two things that I really like about being a professor, I learned way back then. I like teaching. So. The very first day I got in front of that class and had to talk about marginal revenue and marginal costs and supply and demand, I knew that I was good at making complicated uh, subjects rather easy. And then when I worked for the Corps of Engineers, I was actually I didn't really know at the time exactly what I was doing, but I was going around uh, the local area collecting data on different companies and their usage of coal. And what I was really doing was doing uh, some data collection for the empirical portion of uh, another student's PhD dissertation. So I kind of got to be interested in empirical research. And then later in my life, I did a lot of empirical research on baseball players and football sure. players. So so that early experience with the Corps of Engineers really got me uh, interested in research. And the fact that I met Professor Barry was very uh, integral in my being interested in teaching. There's another professor uh, named Howard Leftwich who uh, 
uh, I took a course from him called Labor Problems. And when I first took that course, I had no idea what it was about. But I found out it was about labor relations and unions. And he was such a good teacher. And he was the one that encouraged me to go on for a sure. master's degree. And ultimately, he, he was the one that encouraged me to uh, go to the University of Minnesota. Yeah. At that time, I applied, when I finished my master's degree, I applied for three PhD programs. I applied for Cornell, which is a, one of the best, you know, the New York State School of Industrial and Labor Relations. I applied at Illinois, and then Howard Leftwich said, you may want to think about Minnesota. It's up and coming. Well, lo and behold, I didn't get into Cornell. I didn't get into Illinois, and the rest is history. I was accepted sure. at the University of Minnesota and had a great career there. met my wife in Minneapolis, so I'm really happy that things worked out that way. Very good. In uh, college, did you live on campus? Because you were from Cincinnati. So. Uh, I lived one year with my parents, and then I lived on, uh, not on campus, but on apartments yeah. uh, near the University of Cincinnati. The University of Cincinnati is in Clifton. And so I lived uh, in apartments. And then it, when I went up to Minnesota, I was on my own. I mean, I knew nobody when I went to Minnesota. Actually, uh, it's not quite true. Because this is in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Right. right. Before I went to Minnesota, I was invited to a cousin's bar mitzvah in Zanesville, Ohio. And in Zanesville, Ohio, I met a friend of this cousin who was going also to the University of Minnesota, not in the same field as me. So we by happenstance, it turned out we both had rented apartments in the exact same building. So we became friends and we lived together for a while, but I lived basically in, in apartments around the campus. The, the campus uh, area in the, at the University of Minnesota is known as Dinky Town, and then I moved all around uh, uh, Minneapolis uh, from St. Louis Park to a dine and places sure. like that. And okay, then after you got, what about military service? Did you ever serve in the military? No, okay. I was. I actually was had was called for a physical, but I uh, had had uh, knee surgery f based on my uh, uh, athletic career, and and uh, actually in today's world they would probably scope you, but I had my knee cut wide open. I had a lot of atrophy of the muscle, and I was classified 4F, so I wasn't in the military. You're down. <laughs> okay, how about your career path before you, after you got your degree, before you came to Purdue, what, what transpired, or did you come to Purdue after you got it? Well, uh, it's a good question. When I first um, uh, was finishing my PhD, I knew I wanted to be a professor because of what I told you earlier, and so the, the labor market then was really hot. I mean, it was really good. I had job offers at Kansas and Kansas State and University of Alabama, Auburn, University of Rhode Island. I was about to make a choice, and all of a sudden I had a call from a professor, uh, you may remember him from Purdue, his name was Jim Chelius. He passed away several years back, but he said, Purdue has an opening. And I said, well, listen, gosh, I'm about ready to make a decision. He said, if you can come in quick, we'll make a decision quick. So I figured nothing uh, gained. It's a little close to, so, not too far. So yeah. I flew down here. I remember it was Air Wisconsin. I had to, that little um, plane, <laughs> I and I got here, and uh, I think we ate that night at the, it used to be the Peking restaurant here, and, and uh, I did an interview the next day, and on the way back to the airport, he said, we're going to make you an offer. And they made me an offer, and uh, I learned something about negotiation then, because the offer was, my first salary here at Purdue was $15,000. This was back in 1976. And the other offers I had from the other schools were more like about 18000 And I went into my professor, my major professor, his name's Mario Bagnano. He was also a big uh, influence in my life. And I said, well, um, I think uh, I should probably do some negotiation to try to get a higher salary from Purdue. And he said, well, you can do that if you want. But he said, you might want to consider the fact that Purdue is a, a level above all these other schools. Uh, I mean, I thought Kansas was pretty good and Alabama and Auburn, but Purdue's a, such a better school that he said, I would just take the offer and, and you can always go to one of those other schools in the future. And, and so I took his advice. I took the offer, accepted it, and I started at Purdue. That was my very first job uh, out of college. Uh, I started in January of 1976. Wow. Were you married at that time? Yes. I met okay. my wife up in the Twin Cities. Uh, we got married. Was she in, a, a student there? She school? was a student at the University of Minnesota, but she went to Carthage College. We met actually, if you're familiar with the Mary Tyler Moore Show, we met at the spot on the Nicolette Mall in uh, Minneapolis where Mary Tyler Moore would throw her hat. And, and, and there's a statue there now, and so we go up there and we, get, we have a picture. But we, that's where we met, and we started dating, and we got married in 1973. And our first daughter, Sarah, was born up there in August of 1974, and so when we came here in January of '76, we had about a 15 or no, about 16, 17 month old little baby with us. So it was quite an exciting trip. Sure. Where did you live when you first came here? Um, was, was we, housing wasn't too bad that that no, time. No, we or? moved to uh, Arrowhead Drive. We bought a house. Okay. Uh, which is near the right near the Cumberland School, if you know where that's at. All right. And we lived there from about uh, 1976 and through about 1981. And uh, I got tenured in 1981, and, and actually, I had a chance to go to work for the Department of Labor uh, on a sabbatical. So I had that all planned, and then the wrong party won the presidential election, so my, my plans were a little different. And so instead, 
I decided to take a, I asked if I could take a um, sabbatical back at the University of Minnesota where I had done my PhD. And so I went back there for, actually I stayed for two years on sabbatical, just taught up there. And then I came back here to Purdue, I think in the, in the fall of 83. And by that time, uh, University Farm was opening up. And so we built a house on University Farm on Decatur Street. And that was, I think we were maybe the 10th house on university in university farm that when i go by there now and see that big subdivision all the houses and and i remember the time when it was just dirt and tractors there and there was nothing there there was it nothing was just there. farmland well i remember when we lived on um uh around cumberland avenue that i remember that uh, we would see uh, people um landing hot air balloons on that flat area so we lived in that house for for a while but then in uh, the late uh, early 90s we decided to, uh, we wanted to build a house, so we, another house. We, we bought Phil Haas's old house on Arrowhead Drive, and uh, we redid it, and we lived there for a while until we took the job here at, uh, at my new job I took at uh, Purdue North Central in, in January of 2000. Okay, sounds good. Let's talk a little bit about, let's talk about some of your research that you've done, and then um, teaching. Uh, you, you do collective bargaining, labor relations, and research methods. Yeah. This is in your Craner years. Yeah, when I was at Craner, I started off teaching human resources, and I taught labor relations. I did teach research methods. I like teaching all those classes. I continue to this day. I still teach a couple classes in the Craner School and their executive ed. I teach negotiation, international negotiations. I really enjoyed teaching. Uh, I think um, I have adopted new technology and methodologies over time. So I really enjoyed that. And one of the things I really liked about my field of labor relations is that you could you could do some research in interesting areas. Most people that study unions would uh, pick a, um, a segment, like they'd pick steel, or they'd pick auto, or they'd pick agriculture, or they'd pick retail. Well, I was interested in professional sports, so I picked baseball and football. And I wrote the first book in 1981 on uh, called Owners versus Players, Baseball and Collective Bargaining, and I wrote a lot of... Um, you got a lot of press, good press on that, including an award. Yeah, I won an award for best, one right. of the 10 best books in labor economics in 1981. Uh, I was on just about every major TV show around the country uh, talking about the book. Um, I remember um, the owner of the Texas Rangers at the time, Eddie Childs, called me up and said, we're here in a room with these owners talking about... Uh, labor relations and collective bargaining. I don't think they know anything about it. I've read your book and you know more than any of them. And, and he asked me to do a little consulting for him, so did that. But I, I would say the basic theme of my research over time has been um, why workers join unions and, and what are the impacts of unions. And, and, and today, to this date, I still do that. And you've been called, uh, certainly with some of the baseball possible strikes and things of that sort over time, haven't you? Oh, I've had. Yeah. Usually, anytime there's a, a um, I mean, a dispute in one of the sports, I get some calls. I don't. It's not as much anymore because I don't uh, really uh, keep that active in it as I as I used to. Although I've been asked to write a couple chapters lately, I'm going to do that. But but it used to be, you know, I'd have I could have go back to my office and have six, seven, eight phone call messages to give interviews on radio and things like that. Because I, I mean, I basically knew what was going on, and I mean, I would I'm actually kind of neutral, so I didn't take one side or the other. I think they like that as well. That's a, that's a good good way to go. Um, then you you were the, now in '84. You were the chairman of the MSIR Masters of Science in Industrial Relations. Yes. And then from there you moved to director. Of, so let's talk a little bit about those positions. Yeah, I I uh, felt uh, when I first uh, came to Purdue, I remember talking to Professor Joe Allman, who was one of the full professors at the time. And he said that he said, you know, you really organize. You you'll be, you'll be a good administrator later in life. And then when I came back. Uh, my second stint at Purdue in, in 83, I was named the director of the Master of Science program in Industrial Relations. It's a position I held for a few years. We, just like we have an MBA program, we st and they still have in, in the Craner School, they now call it Human Resources, HR, which is the, the more popular name now. But I enjoyed doing that. I would help students, uh, try to recruit students, help students get signed up for classes. And then it um, seemed like uh, I met Bob Ringel, and that sort of changed my life. I think at that time, Bob Ringel was, um, uh, doing some stuff in the graduate school, and I, actually, I don't remember exactly how I met him, but I was on several committees with him, and I remember him calling me up one day and say, uh, "Dorkin, I'd like you to become an associate dean of the graduate school," and I said, "Well, uh, Dean Ringel, that's very nice, but I want to become a full professor." And he said, "We had a discussion. He said, no, this will actually enhance your probability of becoming a full professor." And I talked to other colleagues in my school, and they said, to "Try it." So I did it, and I had a uh, office in Young Hall, and uh, he was good to work for. I learned a lot from uh, Bob Ringel. He was, became a good friend and mentor. And um, I'd say the thing I learned when I was in the Cranard School, you know, I was even though I was doing the 
some administrative stuff with the uh, IR program, I was just focused on one school. When you get into grad school, you, you go campus-wide. Right. So I worked with people in biology and chemistry and agriculture and all the different areas. I got to meet professors in different realms that I had not known before. And I think I was good at it because a lot of it was resolving problems. And so, hey, that's what I've studied my whole life, mediation and arbitration, how to resolve disputes between people. So I really liked that. And, and, uh, I, just, and I did get promoted to full professor while I was... Uh, in that particular job, so Good. I was pretty happy about that. But then one day, I had this call from the guy who was then the dean of the Cranard School. His name was Ron Frank, and Ron Frank says to me, the associate dean, at that time they only had one associate dean, and his name was Don King. You may remember Don King. Uh, his, he was an organizational behavior specialist. He said, the associate dean is retiring, and uh, I want to hire you as the new associate dean. So that kind of took me by surprise, but I thought about it and uh, talked to Dean Ringel and others. And uh, uh, so July 1st of 1989, I became the Associate Dean yeah. of the Cranard School, which um, basically I was, just, they'll, people say, well, you were Associate Dean for what? I, I was Associate Dean for everything. I, I mean, I did anything. You were it. I, I was it at that time. I was the Associate Dean. Well, but an interesting story about that is probably, oh, well, maybe right after the 4th of July, uh, Ron Frank was on holiday or vacation, and he called me up uh, in my office, and he said, I have something I have to tell you. I said, what's that? He said, I've accepted a job to become the dean of the Emory School of Business. So the guy who hired me was gone, and uh, there was not clear. There was Dennis Widenauer was uh, working in development at that time. I think they called him associate dean for development, so it was probably not true. I was the only associate dean, but I was the one that was working on all the academic matters. And I had several people come in to me at that time said, do you want to be the dean of the Cranard School? And I said, well, you know, it's an awfully n nice uh, offer, but I've only been associate dean for two days. I think I don't even know what I'm doing here yet, so I probably shouldn't be the dean. So Steve Beering, who was the president at the time, appointed Dennis Widenauer as acting dean, and then they had a search, and then he was appointed the dean, and then I basically from uh, 89, uh, June, July 1st of 1989 until uh, about June 30th, 1999, 10 years, I worked under Dennis Widenauer as the associate dean of the Cranard School, and I got to do lots of stuff. I, I, I'm um, very proud of that time here. You can look at uh, a lot of the people who are in the Cranard School now, and I hired a lot of them. You know, I go to some of these board of trustees meetings, and I see that this professor or that professor is becoming a chaired professor or whatever, a named professor, and uh, I think to myself, it makes me feel good. I hired that person, and I had to do all the, the, not all the recruiting, but all the negotiation and making sure people, you know, were comfortable with the package. I worked a lot with the Cranard School Alumni Association, so I got to know a lot of alums in different places, and I would visit alums in Florida and all over the place. So I, I still know you a lot really of Cranard alums. A big plate to, that yeah. you covered. Yeah, I enjoyed that. And uh, I was in charge of all the promotion and tenure types of activities. Back then, we didn't have departments in the Cranard School. They had areas, economics, management, and OBHR. So I was basically the department head for everybody. So I got involved in all the different... Uh, promotion and tenure meetings, and I was the one that had to give all the feedback to people. You did get promoted. If somebody got fired, I had to take care of that. Um, wow. So it was um, really... What uh, about uh, development and advancement in those I, days? And yeah. of course, it changed when Dr. Jeske came. But yeah, when, when um, Dennis yeah, Widener... Vision 21 was in the bearing years, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. When when uh, Dennis Widener took over, and he was no did longer... He, and he was in, acting, and then he became dean? Yeah, he became okay. dean. He wanted to hire a development person, so we hired Kay Moore. Uh, and um, actually, Greg Cap worked for us a while too, in development. And um, but Kay Moore would uh, help me, and, and actually went on several trips with Kay, and learned uh, about uh, development activities. And some of the stuff I learned from him has been very useful to me in, in my sure. role as chancellor. So I would say my major uh, uh, role was not development, but I helped out. I mean, I know that I had people that I had talked to, and and uh, we had uh, lots of people that I was. A lot of friend raising and the friends that I have to this day. Some friends that I made uh, back in the Craner days, in fact, donated money to Purdue North Central. And so it's quite a, it's quite nice that you can make, you know, you know, you can make friends. And you never know, and you may have something That's in right. their will or something like that. It's good to cast the net and keep working yeah. on there. It takes right. a lot of work. That's one thing I learned about development. Touch, touch, touch. <laughs> right. Yeah. A couple things in the, uh, uh, let's talk <clears throat> about the Craner School. One is diversity in that uh, the Cordell Bell's program, the business yeah. opportunity. Well, unfortunately for researchers, he's since passed away. Yes. I worked and a lot with Cornell Bell. In fact, I helped when they started the Cornell Bell um, Endowment Fund. I helped start that. Good. And I was very uh, much... Great person. Yeah, very he was great. He was fun to work with. He uh, 
One thing about Cornell Bell, he always had the interests of his students in mind. I mean, he, he would really go to bat for his students. He was the best at recruiting, knowing all the families. I, I can never forget. He had a lot him. of personal. Yeah. Uh, just interacted really well with them. Well, when we'd have a banquet and some student would stand up, he, he would know way back in history all, <clears throat> all about <clears throat> their parents and grandparents. And, sure. and he, he just did a great job in recruiting the students and, and actually got me kind of interested. In, and so I, one of the things I did as associate dean, I visited quite a few of the uh, historically black uh, colleges and universities, and I helped establish some recruiting ties there, uh, Hampton and uh, uh, places like that. So I felt um, like I, that was uh, another part of my job that was kind of important. But but no, Cornell Bell was uh, uh, an entity unto himself. I mean, he had, he has a network of uh, of people all around the country. I think one thing if you, you could say is after you're gone, if people uh, that you've helped uh, have made a difference in their own lives, they go on and help other people. And he did a lot of that. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just uh, no great doubt mentor. He had a great he had a a real good sense of that too, I mm -hmm. think. And he started with John Day, so he went way back. In fact, when I started at the Cranner School, my very first dean was, was actually the first dean was M. Weiler. Uh, he was a dean for a while, and then John Day took over when M. Weiler got sick. And then I remember one day, uh, this is way before email, but we had, I don't know if we all got phone calls, or uh, there's a special meeting at four o'clock in the Cranner Auditorium. And uh, the dean wants to have a special meeting. And I remember people, what's this about? And one person said to me, well, the last time we had a special meeting, the dean announced that he was going to resign. I went in there and the dean said, that's what he said, basically he resigned. And that's when we uh, went on a search. And um, I think Bill Llewellyn was acting dean for a year. Then they hired Keith Smith. So I can honestly say that at the Cranard School, um, when I first came, it was M. Weiler and then John Day and then Bill Llewellyn and then um, Keith Smith and then Dennis Widenauer and Actually, for a month uh, between the transition of Dennis and Dean Kozier, I was acting dean, and then, of course, I, I knew Rick Kozier real well. I've been friends with him for a long time. So sure. I've known every dean of the Cranard School That's pretty great. well. That's great. What a legacy. Right. Yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, we talked about the Cranard Charitable Trust. Of course, that doesn't exist anymore, does it? The Cranard Charitable Trust, I guess, it got started to get the money for the Cranard uh, I really don't. I can't really yeah, answer probably that. probably not. Um, rankings, that's kind of a key thing. Yeah, we used to work a lot on rankings. Um, oh, boy, I, is that really? I remember in the um, uh, over in the, the years. Yeah, over the years, in, in the both in the dean's advisory council meetings and the Cranard School Alumni Association meetings, rankings were really important, yeah. and we did our best to try to improve improve in the rankings. And it it depends on a lot of things, like your placement record, and uh, uh, how well you do in terms of your students, like what their test scores are and their GPAs, and you know also some uh, stuff about what the students say about. Uh, how, how they like the faculty. So we worked really hard on that. We hired placement directors and we worked very hard at getting the best students and we tried to give students intern opportunities. And so I think uh, I feel really well, really good that uh, the Cranard School has had some very good rankings over the years and they've yeah. traditionally been in the top 20 in executive yeah. education, sometimes higher than that. Some rankings have been as high as number one. So, you know, there's a little variability in rankings just like maybe in stock prices. And so I'm not too worried if you're 19 one year and 14 or no. 13 the next year because you're going to bounce up and down right. just a bit. But we used to look very carefully at those formulas and try to see what we could do to to make sure we had had uh, um, you know the best rankings we could. And the thing is, we had we had all the ingredients because we had very good faculty. We, our faculty were hired from the best schools, and we made yeah. sure we got the best faculty. And then we had very good students. And so when you put those two together, you know the next thing you needed was really very good facilities, and that's why. Uh, Dennis Widenauer was so involved with building Rawls Hall because we really, you know, the Cranard building was nice and the Cranard Center was nice, but we didn't really have the facility that could make it make us competitive with uh, many of the other schools. So right. Rawls Hall, when that came online, I think in 2003, they made a big difference for the Cranard sure did. Yeah, School. It really did. That's really nice. And then we talked about the deans. You had quite a few that you were involved with, too. Um, that Cranard Executive Forum um, that brought the boardroom, those at lectures, that series. Yes. Yeah, I was involved with that actually for, okay. for quite a few years. I would, the night before the person would come in, and, and uh, Dennis Widenauer and I would take the person out to dinner. So I've had, had I can recall many dinners over the years uh, uh, with uh, speakers, and so that was a lot of fun. Then I'd usually go to the forum. Uh, uh, Dennis would go most of the time as well, but if he didn't go, I'd go in his stead. And sure. I used to like to go and listen to the speakers. I was not so much involved in um, generating the list of speakers, but I did. Uh, Work interact with, and uh, meet them and things. Did meet them and, and I think that that was a really good experience for the students and actually the 
undergraduate students got the chance to do planning and they got to host and it's a good uh, maturing experience for the students to meet somebody like that and people like that and they get to ask questions and I think it's interesting to ask a person who's a CEO what do you do with your time all day or what kind of hobbies you have or what advice would you give us as new people if we want to be in your job? So I think it's great to be able to learn from leaders. So it's all about leadership. Right, yeah. What The Craner Center for Executive Education and Research, that, how did that get started? The dedication was in 83. Yeah. You know, actually, probably Dennis Widenauer uh, and, and others worked with that. that. That was dedicated. I remember going to the dedication. It was, right. uh, I think, uh, Maybe it was a January first of '83 or something like that. Right. And but I was not really involved with that, so I'm not the one to, to talk How about. How did they? Did they? Had they been thinking about having a, a such a uh, program and a facility like that? I believe so, but time? you know, I wasn't in administration sure. at the time, so I really don't know. I assume it was p people like John Day and others who thought that uh, right. we need to. Uh, uh, be not only have the master's program, but we need to have executive education as well. I mean, I was heavily involved with the weekend program, for instance. Uh, I remember uh, oh, we good. had we set up this executive program, and then somebody said, uh, "What about a weekend program for local residents?" Because the executive program, you pe have people come in from all over the country and the world. So we had meetings with all these different local businesses, and we finally set up a program. And I remember the very last meeting. I don't know who said it, but one person said, "A businessman, you guys have really been good. You've listened to us." You've set up the program we want on Saturdays. Now it's our duty to put the s people in the seats. And we thought we'd run the program one time and that would be it. And uh, I think they run it about every two or three years. There's, there seems like to be perpetual demand for that. So I was involved with that. I was involved with the start of the, Ger the Gizma, German International School of Management and Administration in, in Hanover. So I, I had lots of duties. Anything that uh, Dean Widenauer asked me to do, I would do. And, sure. uh, and um and you're still affiliated. Are you still teaching in that executive education one? Yeah, oh, my, actually, my tenure. I think at Purdue you get tenure at, at the where you, at the campus where you earned it. So my, I'm a full professor at the Cranert School, and I um, I have a little office in the Cranert Center, and I do teach in executive education, not, not very much. I teach like on Saturdays a little bit, and sure. in January and February. But one other thing I, I wanted to mention is um, Dennis Widenauer and I were really good friends, and. On many occasions, you know, he would have something happen he didn't like, and he'd come into my office and he'd have a letter, and he'd say, "I'm going to send this letter." And it was pretty, you know, he, he'd get a little bit aggravated, and and uh, this is where some of my skills came in. So I'd read the letter, and I'd say, "You know, this is a really good letter. You made your point." But I think what I would suggest is take the letter, fold it up, put it in your desk, go home, have a nice dinner, maybe a glass of wine. When you come in in the morning, read it again, see if you still want to send it. And all, invariably, he'd come in the next morning and said, "Well." Turn up my letter. I don't want to send it. And, <laughs> well, you know, it made kinda, some editorial. It kind of yeah, reminds me of uh, you know with, with email today. People sometimes send oh, back I a know. message before thinking. They call that flaming, and and uh, it's just uh, you know you have to really you need to really think things out. So I think that's a good lesson for people as well. Very good. And I think email. That's a good point because people tend to answer it real quick and they don't really think things yep, through. That's right. You need to do that. Mm -hmm. You know and that's why writing it longhand. Uh, I think the um, then. The, the uh, family, you talked a little about yes. that. Did your children come to Purdue? Uh, to no, Purdue? actually we had a daughter, Sarah, and our son, David, and uh, they both went to IU. Uh, she, Sarah's got a, a bachelor's degree in communication and a, a, a master's degree in information, I think library and information science from IU. And David's got a, a bachelor's degree from the uh, Kelly School, but he also he did come back here and got his MBA in the, in the executive program at Purdue. So I was, I had the great honor of being able to be up on stage a couple of years ago and uh, hand him his diploma. He works for Roche in Indianapolis, and uh, my daughter works for Indiana Grant Makers Alliance, also in Indianapolis. And we have three grandchildren. Uh, our daughter has three children: uh, a daughter uh, Sarah, or no, a daughter Allison, who's eight; a daughter Abigail, who's six; and uh, their grand our grandson Jimmy is about. Uh, he was born in December. A couple of years ago, so he's about 18 months old. <laughs> that keeps you. Then it's nice that they're close. Yeah, they're close. Which is it's really very good. nice. We get to see them pretty often. Yeah. Are you still doing some consulting and um, finding and arbitrating? I know you've done that. I'm an time. arbitrator. Yeah, I've yeah. actually in two in the year 2000, I was admitted into the National Academy of Arbitrators, which is a, a great honor for me in my yes, life. Yes, congratulations. I saw that. That's and um, so I'm a labor arbitrator. I don't. I can't do a lot of cases because of my. Uh, full-time job, but I, I do a little consulting, and I'm, I'm keeping, you know, the fire uh, kindled so I can, uh, once I retire, I'll, I can do that as long as I want. Sure. Do a little bit of fact-finding once in a while, and I serve on some boards, so yeah, I do a little bit. Yeah. Um, now I think we'll talk about you, professional associations, you've got Indiana Society of Chicago. For the researchers, just tell us what that, uh, when they, if they hear Indiana Society of Chicago, 
It's, I know it's a long-term one, but yeah, I'm thinking it, of it. Well, right. actually, I belong to that just because I, I live so close, and I sure. thought it was a good thing to do. But it's just a John group. McCutcheon is the one. Yeah, who, it's a group of people who, uh, uh, um, like, uh, live in Chicago or in the Chicago area, or they could live in Indiana, and they belong to the society. They have one meeting a year. It's usually just a party, and uh, uh, different groups come, and they have speakers, and they have, you know, each year they tend to... Uh, honor one university. I remember one year they honored Purdue and, and uh, Martin Jiski, and I think one year they honored Indiana University. So it's a, you know, it's a tradition. How it's large not, an organization, now, would you say? Uh, I think they probably have a thousand members. They have a, When they have a meeting, it's a, it's a huge dinner and <laughs> the parties go on. So it's not something I'm real active in, but I do know I belong because I think it's a good thing to belong to. <laughs> it is, a, and it's an old organization yes. too. It's been in sort of tied. Usually the governors Purdue. go. Right. The Academy of Management, are you still involved? No, I don't, no. I'm not involved in that. Yeah. I'm, okay. Actually, I'm involved with the National Academy of Arbitrators, and um, uh, that's about it anymore. I, I'm, I just, uh, I don't get involved. I don't go to too many research meetings. I do belong to ASCU, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, and I go to those meetings. And I am a member, I'm a board member of uh, what's called Campus Compact. I'm actually a board member of Indiana Campus Compact, and also I'm a board member of the National Board. Uh, Campus Compact is an organization that promotes uh, civic engagement and service learning, so I'm very involved with that. But those are pro bono, and, sure. and I, I'm, I'm, I just believe, and I know in my heart, that um, students who are uh, more involved in their communities will uh, be better citizens, and they will uh, vote, and they will help others, and so we, I try to promote that as much as I can. Yeah, good. Um, what about any other awards and honors? I know you got that the one that just the National Academy of Arbitrators. Any yes, other? I've had since I've been chancellor at Purdue uh, North Central. I've had several awards for um, my pro bono work. I'm, I've been on the board of the um, uh, Laporte United Way and also uh, Porter County, and they made me a um, emeritus member of the Laporte County United Way once I went off the board, which I think means you're getting old. And uh, I'm still on the. Um, we hope you stay on. <laughs> I'm, st I'm still on the um, Porter County uh, United Way board. I've won several awards for uh, economic development from Michigan City Chamber of Commerce and, and places like that. So I've I've had uh, several awards for my work in economic development, and uh, for what I've done in in the community. And I think um, they, all those awards are very are nice. very humbling, and but they make make me feel very good. And I'm also a Rotarian. And uh, I'm very proud of that. I think that's a nice organization. It is. It really is. Let's talk about the chancellorship at, uh, make some comments on that. Yes. How did that come about? Well, that's a really interesting research? story okay. because I had, re I had resigned from the associate deanship. And I thought, for a fact, that I was going to just be a professor at Cranor because I really liked that. I'd been associate dean for 10 years, and I figured Rick Kosher would come in. He should pick his own associate dean. So I, I just tendered my resignation. And um, probably... Two weeks after that, I had received a phone call from Stephen Beering, who was the president. And um, Steve Beering had, uh, you know, he, he was an interesting guy. He, yes. you know, I told you about my baseball book. He asked for a copy and he read it, and we had a lot of discussion about it. He knew a lot about baseball growing up in Pittsburgh. And um, he called me up and he said, I want to thank you for being the um, uh, interim dean in the month period between when Dean Widenauer resigned and, and when uh, Dean Kosher took over. And I thought, well, that's an interesting, nice thing for him to call, but I bet he's got something else. And, he said, and then he said, oh, I have one more thing I'd like to talk to you about, uh, uh, Jim. I said, what's that? He said, we've been uh, uh, looking for a chancellor for the Purdue North Central Campus. And uh, Bob Ringel and I have been going over the list of our people who are really good administrators who aren't in an administrative role right now. And you came up at the top of our list. And he said to me, do you think you might be interested in the job? And I didn't, at first I, w I didn't really know what to say, but uh, Steve Beering's a hard guy to say no to. So Nancy and I, my wife Nancy and I, got in the car, drove up to the North Central campus and took a look around, and then I called Dr. Beering back, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll make an application. And he said, you know, I just can't give you the job. You have to go up and interview, and you have to, you know, win the job. And I did, and I... Why, how, did, how was it open? It, it, Dale had Dale... Dale, Dale had reached the mandatory retirement age. Oh, okay. And he had, actually, he had been extended, I think, one or two years, and they were looking for... A new person. So I went up and I interviewed and I did fine. He made me an offer and oh gosh that was in maybe October of uh, 99 and uh, I started that job uh, uh, January 1st of 2000. In fact on January 1st of 2000 I was at a bowl game. Purdue had a bowl game in Florida and I went you know and I was at the bowl game. I was a kid that was my first official duty as a chancellor. I attended a bowl game <laughs> but uh, no it, that's, I've been there for ten and a half years. It's been quite a 
quite a great opportunity for me. So I, I thank uh, Dr. Beering every time I can. Uh, I only worked for him for about six months because Martin Jiski started in August of uh, 2000. Right. And so I worked for him for most of my career. And then for the last three years, I've worked with France. So I've worked under three presidents, and it's been uh, just a joy to be at Purdue North Central. We're located in uh, LaPorte County, but we also have a, an operation in Porter County. We've grown from about 3,100 students to we have maybe 4,500 students now. And this fall, we may be over 5,000 students. We've grown from six uh, academic programs to 19, and we're, we're our strategic plan is to go to 25 academic programs. We've gone from a situation where we probably raised $100,000 a year to where we're bringing in well over a million dollars a year. And sometimes we get huge gifts like a half a million dollars. Um, we've increased the number of faculty members. So it's been a just a, a joy for me. I've really enjoyed that job from, from day one. Not everything's been been, you know, great every day. I mean you have you have your ups and downs. The budget situation hasn't been as good as we would like, but uh, I think we make a big, big difference in Laporte and Porter County because there are a lot of students up there, unlike um, the main campus where a lot of students come and their parents support them full time and they can be a full time student. Most of our students are what we call place bound. And that means that they're, they live in Valparaiso, they're going to live there the rest of their lives, or they live in Michigan City or Laporte, so they maybe can't become a full time student. They have to work. They have to earn their way through college. And so sometimes it takes them six, seven, eight, ten years. I've got a lot of examples of, uh, of our students who graduated nine or ten years who are chief financial officers of banks or big corporations. And uh, they're very thankful that uh, they had that uh, opportunity to go to a regional right. campus. Yeah. And the same is true for all the regional campuses around uh, the state of Indiana. Do you have any res are you building do you have a residence hall there now or not? No, or actually that's one of the things we did accomplish though. Oh. Across the street from uh, Purdue North Central Campus, uh, a developer came in and, and uh, he started a housing development. So they have ten apartment buildings which are gorgeous and they have for, single this is for student housing? Uh, the, they'll rent anybody. anybody. Oh okay. Uh, we have probably maybe of the ten buildings, four of them are filled with students and the other six with, with the just general population. And then uh, there's single family homes as well. So people are, you know, you're right across the street. It's like walking from um, Stewart Center to the Cranor Building. That's how far you have to go in order to get Super. to classes. So we're really proud of that. Also, one of the things we've accomplished during the time I've been chancellor, we work hard on economic development. So we uh, started a conservancy district, which uh, basically brings water and sewer utilities to the campus and all along the 421 corridor between Westville and the campus. And basically what that does is when businesses or hospitals or any entities are looking to uh, for a site where they want to locate, one of the things they're looking for is do you have utilities? So we now may have it possible so they can have gas, electric, water, and sewer. And so right across the, from the campus, a uh, Michiana Oncology Hematology is going in. We have several other new developments that have gone in down the street, a, a branch of a bank. And as, as the economy picks up, that whole corridor is going to perk up and you're going to see uh, lots and lots of development. So that's another thing I'm really proud of since I've been at Purdue North Central, the, what we've done for economic development. We've, um, in LaPorte County where the campus is located, there's been, there are two big cities. One is LaPorte and one is Michigan City. And they've always been quite rival, they have been rivals and they fight each other. And one of the things I've tried to do is, is to have them form an alliance. And basically, now we're at the point where they say, we don't care if a new business comes into LaPorte or whether it comes into Michigan City, or whether it comes into the county. All we care about is it comes in here because it's good for all of us. <laughs> so again, I, I think I put some of my mediation skills to work there. It takes, it takes a long time, but to finally, you know, you see the light, which is really good. Right. And the enrollment, would you have a doctoral program? No, uh, most uh, regional campuses. Are you doing a master's? Or? Regional campuses do uh, undergraduate programs, and okay. we have two master's programs, one okay. in education, elementary ed, and we have an MBA program. So we're really proud of that program. It's on Saturdays, actually, in our Porter County site. Okay. Um, how about uh, a favorite Purdue tradition? I would say my favorite Purdue tradition, when we used to live in town here, when my son was younger, we would uh, come to the football games, and I would uh, uh, come over and park in my Cranet parking spot. We might go get something to eat in the Union, then we'd walk across campus to the game, and actually where we lived, sometimes if, if we walked, we've sometimes even walked in, then we could walk home. I have to tell you that sometimes 
in the older days when the team wasn't too good, the best part of the game when it was started, when it was 0 0, it sometimes was 45 to nothing at halftime, and we'd walk home. And, uh, you could, uh, but uh, that, that was a fun tradition. Also, coming down to the fountain, we used to have some dogs and down to the fountain when, when Dr. Beering had uh, taken the, the parking lot out in front of Hovde Hall. Sure. And we used to like to hang around the fountain. So, those are some traditions that, that I've really enjoyed. Yeah. How about an outstanding event? Well, in my life, I'd say my outstanding event was meeting my wife, and because uh, we've been married for 37 years, and it's been just, uh, you know, we met in Minneapolis, and she's been with me through it all, and she's been uh, just uh, helped me, me with everything we've done, from the family to the job, and sure. so that's been rather outstanding for me. Um, and having the our two children, and then with the three grandchildren, having been able to hold each of them uh, within an hour of when they were born, that's been pretty outstanding. But in terms of an outstanding Purdue event, I must say that um, I was proud of my initial promotion and tenure. I was proud of getting promoted to full professor. And I think getting the job as a chancellor at uh, Purdue North Central uh, is a big highlight for me and uh, because it's, it's opened up so many doors and mm -hmm. so many opportunities that I would not have otherwise had. And you're able to take advantage of them, which I, is really nice. I feel really blessed to be able to take advantage of serving on some of these boards and and some of the pro bono activities because it's all about helping people and mm -hmm. I think I've made a difference. All right. How about some reflections and, and the closing thing, I'll leave it up to you, something I either forgot to ask or however you'd like, whatever, or I'll leave it up to you. Well, I would just like to say that uh, I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed my career at Purdue. It's not over. I've got a ways to go yet, but, but it's been a great uh, career. It's. Um, Professors sometimes are a little bit like baseball players. They don't stay at the same team very often. They don't stay at the same school very often. But I've had my whole career at Purdue, and I think I'm one of the few people that has been both at the main campus and also at one of the regional campuses. Okay. So I feel like I really understand the whole system and how it works. I've had the opportunity to work with some great people, and uh, I'm just uh, really blessed to have known a lot of good people. I've had a lot of good mentors, and I try uh, in my later years here at Purdue to give back and try to mentor other people so that I can maybe leave them with some of the pearls of wisdom that other people have left me with in the past. And so I'm just very pleased with uh, how things have gone for me at Purdue. My career has been uh, wonderful, and I, ha I have a lot more that I want to do, and uh, I thank you for taking the time to record some of this history. Right. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank Parker. you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank